All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to class three of Audio MIDI One, spring 2022. How's everybody doing today? Good. You? I'm hanging in there. Um, yeah, it's been insanely busy this week. Uh, I just finished this morning, late this morning, the first draft of this uh, one hour documentary I'm scoring for ESPN. Filmmakers are handing it in tomorrow and they're going to be airing clips from it on the during the SEC tournament broadcast next week. We'll probably get notes back, and then probably maybe ten days or so, or two weeks, I'll have to probably get back and rework some of the music as the film gets re-edited. That's always fun, but it was this last week just trying to get everything finished was really stressful. Let's put it that way. <laughs> The last week before deadline, that it always gets a little crazy. But aside from that, I'm thankful for the work, and that's you know very thankful for that. Plus, it's where we are right now. It was 80 degrees today, and I know it's warm up in New York, but it's pretty warm down here. So I've been able to just get out every morning and enjoy this that a little bit before I start working. So just a couple of uh, some technical things here. So next week, there is going to be no in-person class. I'm going to be traveling. So that's the 24th. There'll be no in-person class. The next in-person class will be on March the 3rd. All right. I will not be available. I mean, I'll have my phone with me, but we're going to be traveling for three days. We have a couple stops to make. So I won't be back in, in, in my home until Sunday Uh, at some point Sunday, and then I'll be up and running. I'll get everything hooked back up in my studio on the 28th. So next week, there is no in-person class, but that's okay because I've got stuff for us. And in our class folder today, uh, let's see, class materials, it's class three. You can download all the stuff here. I've got instructions. Next week, there'll be no in-person class. You will upload the assignment from today, right? So what we work on today, you're going to upload that as you normally would. I will get to it, you know, Monday, uh, on the first Monday. And last, I guess that's the 28th is Monday or Tuesday. So I'll, I'll get on it as soon as I can. But still hand it in on time. And... What's going to end up happening is that we're going to do the bar talk. You're going to do more work on the bar talk for next week. Then you'll take a break from the bar talk. You're going to do this assignment that I'm going to give you now. And then we'll get back to the bar talk starting on March the 3rd. We'll continue on with that. But there are two videos I've got up on my YouTube site. They're breakdown videos of these two tracks I just released, Same As It Ever Was and Neptune Beach. They're about 50 minutes long each, and there are chapters set up in each video, right? So you're going to watch these two videos. You could watch, and so there, so in other words, you can navigate back and forth pretty easily. So as you watch, take some notes. Pay attention to how I've organized my session. That includes color coding, use of markers, or what's called memory locations they're both the same thing in pro tools they, they, they markers that memory locations and markers are on the same part of the rulers but they serve different purposes they look the same but we'll get into that and as the semester unfolds then you'll look at how i've treated each instrument eq compression all that stuff How are the treatments to each instrument affecting the sound? Are they corrective? In other words, does the sound, is there a funny ring in the sound that I'm using some corrective EQ to get out? Or is it enhancing the sound, making it like a little bit beefier, right? Or bringing out some of the high end? Do, Do they, well, do they, that's a typo there. Do they correct problems found in the recorded sound or is the sound changed to make it easier to fit into the track? How are time-based effects used? These would be reverb and echo or delay. And how are the instruments in each grouping panned? How does the arrangement unfold? Listen to how the instruments enter, when they're silent, 
what kind of aggregate sounds are used. So what I mean by aggregate sounds is that I may have three or four percussion instruments all grouped together. And how do I build up that choir, the percussion choir? What is the function of each of those? Is there a shaker that does, you know, it's keeping straight eighth notes and then there might be a mid-range drum and then there might be a lower drum. And how, how do those things work together, right? And, and how do the in different instrumental groups work in concert? So how does, let's say, the percussion work with the drums? How does the percussion work with the piano? How does the piano work with the guitars? You know, like, think about some of how the different, I talk about it during the breakdown, right? This is a big part of the work that I try to impart upon all of my students is make sure that all the, when you're, when you're working on a track, you want to make sure that all the different food groups of your instruments, they all work together so that, you know, you can just solo out any two instruments and that should work, right? Now, how it works is different. They might be sometimes in conflict or sometimes in concert. So those are decisions that you have to make as a composer and an arranger and a music creator content creator but they should work together all right so what are the stylistic differences between each piece so basically you're going to advance on the idea of the musical blueprint that we went over and you'll do that because this track has the advantage of hearing all the instruments in isolation and also in different combinations and you'll do a two two page essay essay on this right so it's it's compare and contrast like some 400 to 500 words and it's due on the third and this, is, and this is what you'll title it with your initials replacing mine. So, yeah. So instead of having a class that's two and a half hours next week, you're going to watch two, two 50 minute videos and then spend a couple of hours writing your, your, um, your, your essay. All right. And, and just try, I want you to li learn how to listen and dig in, and you'll see some advanced techniques. Right. Some of these things are pretty advanced in there and you'll see where you can get to with the study once you get away from MIDI. But there's audio. So this is dealing mostly with how to treat audio, which we will get into towards two thirds of the way through the semester. So any question on that? All right. So we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff today and we are going to continue on with the bar talk and the next steps. But the first few things I want to talk about is I want to explain I want to explain how timing works inside of a digital sequencer. And when we think about music, if you're a trained musician and you learn how to read music, right, you learn the different timings of different kinds of notes. You learn what a whole note is, a half note, a quarter note, an eighth note, a sixteenth note, what happens when you dot a note, what happens when you make triplets, all this stuff. These are part of your training, the, the rhythmic values and how they fit in and against a beat, especially if you're a rhythm section player. This type of stuff is really essential for creating grooves. So sequencers do have those kinds of things to think about. I've showed you that there are places where you can look at rhythmic values for the setting up the grid but what what is this ticks business right that I've, I've mentioned a few times so to do that i want to talk about resolution first and i want to talk a little bit about the history of uh of the resolution inside of a sequencer so you know in pho photography if you're going to print something right they, there's a something called dpi and that is dots per inch so if we take a look at this photograph here, if you're going to print something out that's 10 dots per inch, you're going to get an image, a circle, that's going to kind of look like this, right? If you do 72 dots per inch, it looks a little bit more circular, but if you zoom in, you could see the edges are, are rectangular, right? Oh, let's see. Then if you get to 300 dots per inch, which is over here, that looks the most circular. Again, it's not completely accurate because as I zoom in, you can see that there's still rough edges there, right? And that's just the nature of it. But what, uh, what of, of digital 
uh, of digital data. But what ends up happening is that there are so many dots per inch there that we perceive things as having the same kind of flow and linear uh, presentation as a painting or an analog, if you looked at something on an analog film negative, right? So how does that look with real images? So let's take a look at these two images right here. So you could see that this bird here on the right, this is printed out at 72 dots per inch. Now it looks, when I zoom way in like that, you could see that it's furry. But if I do this, right, it looks much sharper on your TVs, on your computer screens, right? Because it's smaller. So, you know, when people are looking at something on their phones that's put on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or something like that, having a low resolution, it really looks fine. Now we can see here, this looks much, much sharper and much more detailed, right? And even as I zoom in on this, it still looks much sharper, right? Because that's 300 dots per inch. Uh, and I can zoom in even further. And then you can see once I get really far in that this is not what it seems, right? You could see that the, the on these edges here, things are blurry and you could see that these are rectangles and squares and all that stuff. But when you look at it, right, like this, that looks pretty sharp on the left and what's on the right looks pretty blurry at the same size. So the resolution of those things will give you a certain quality to the image. Now, back in the day before sequencers happened, and I will when we deal with audio, I'm going to do like a little history of recording and we'll talk about that. But basically, the way that you would record things was to record them onto analog tape. And you have this tape that has two reels. You have the reel that has the tape and then it goes through and then there's the pickup, the makeup reel or whatever it's called. And as it's traveling from one reel to the other, it goes through a bunch of things that are called heads, magnetic heads. And one head is the record head and the other head is the playback head. And as you record something, the tape goes past the record, the record head and the magnetic particles that are on the tape get rearranged. And those rearranged sounds become, they get, turned into audio on the playback, right? There's the transducers involved and all this stuff. I'll, I'll get into this more detail. But basically in that world of tape, that's called analog because there's no digital component to it. It's There's no computer chips spitting out ones and zeros, binary code. And as such, it's much more akin to a drawing with a pencil on paper or painting with a brush on a canvas in that we as humans can make, oh, excuse me, can make steady lines as we're drawing and painting because what we're doing is not being reduced into ones and zeros. And so the same thing with analog tape. So what, what you're hearing has a kind of roundness and smoothness to it that in the early days of digital recording was not found. And because, and we will definitely get more into this when we talk about audio. We'll go right through sampling rates and, and uh, bit depth and all this stuff and how it affects the audio quality. But just right now, this is an introduction for timing. And so when people would play things and record things, the rhythm would get recorded exactly as they played it, right? When you play something into a sequencer, it gets set onto a, a predetermined grid. And you can't you can see the grid like up to 64th notes in Pro Tools, but you can't see the complete grid that the notes will land on. And so in the early days of, of hardware sequencers, that they decided that 24, a grid of 24 equally spaced spots between each beat would be the minimum. And the reason for that is that 24 is divisible both by two 
and by three. So you can make all of your straight notes, your eighth notes, your 16th notes, your quarter notes, half notes, whole notes, and you could also make triplets, right? Because if you had 24, what they called pulses per quarter note between each beat, each eighth note triplet, 24 divided by three would be eight. So you'd have eight pulses per triplet. So 24 was the minimum. Um, and that was the first sequencer that I got had 24 pulses per quarter note. Or, and then, the, then they started making them that were 96 pulses per quarter note, right? Double, uh, four times 24. So, um, right, so that had many more spots that your note could land. So it was a much more accurate representation of what you were playing. Still not rhythmically precise because you could play something that's sort of in between one of those pulses and that's still audible to the human ear. But it was certainly less stiff than 24 uh, uh, pulses per quarter note. Now, let me just say, this has to do with digital sequencers. This has not to do with that Moog sequencer that we saw at the in the first um, class. I, I, did I show that in this class? I usually show that in my classes. Maybe I didn't show that. But in the days of analog synthesis, all sequencers were all voltage controlled and voltage is analog. It's not, there's no digital uh, component to that. So the last hardware sequencer I had, which was called an MC50 Mark II, had a floppy disk in it. That had a resolution of t twice as much as the 96 pulses per quarter note. That was 192 pulses per quarter note. So you could see that much like 72 dots per inch versus 300 dots per inch, you're getting a much more accurate representation of what you're playing. And the first computer sequencer program that I used, which was called Vision, came with a resolution of 192 pulses per quarter note. And at that time, which is 1991 or 92, almost all the sequencers had that. And then as time went on, they started doubling that and doubling that. And so now Pro Tools has a resolution of 960 pulses per quarter note. So it's, I don't know, 40 times more than the very first one that I started out with. And Logic and Cubase and Performer, you can make your um, pulses per quarter note, much, you can set them up at whatever re resolution you want within a certain parameter and you could have something that's 9,600 pulses per quarter note and that. So, so once you start getting up to this close to a thousand, it becomes much more difficult to s feel, there's many, much less spots where you can actually place the note that don't fit actually into that grid. Right, so they're not called pulses per quarter note anymore. They're called ticks. So that nomenclature changed at some point over the last 20 years. So that in all sequencers, whether it's Performer, Cubase, Reaper, Ableton, GarageBand, and Pro Tools, the space between each quarter note is called a tick, each one of those 960 bits. So let's take a look at, so there is a text in here that if you wanted to read, right, that I've got here to just make it a little bit more explainable to you. Okay, so I've got this in here. I've explained it pretty well. There might be a few things in here. Okay, so this is one bar of 4-4. Four, four. It doesn't matter the tempo. Right, the pulses per quarter note does not change. The ticks between each quarter note does not change based on the tempo. And this is gonna become apparent once we start using um, elastic audio later in the semester. This is a very important point. Anything that is tick-based in Pro Tools or any sequencer, so that means it's time-based is these 960 ticks per quarter note. That is not tempo dependent. At 60 beats a minute, you'll still you'll have 960 ticks between each quarter note, and at uh, uh, 
200 beats a minute, you'll still have that. My dog is barking because people are outside. I apologize for that. She's a, a noisy thing. <laughs> she likes to talk. Um, so, um, right. So at 200 beats per minute, there's still 960 ticks between each quarter note, right? So let's take a look at this little chart that I made here. So you'll see here that this top line here, these are quarter notes. This is the beats. So one, two, three, four. And then this next line is eighth notes. You know, everybody who's a musician here knows this, right? So there's two eighth notes for each quarter note. And there's four sixteenth notes for each quarter note and two sixteenth notes for each eighth note. So the way that that works right here is that Pro Tools gives you the timing on the counter in three separate spots. You've got one, a number, a number, and then three numbers. So the first number is the bar, the second number is the beat, and the third number is the ticks. So if we look here at every beat in Pro Tools, we have three zeros as the very first tick. So some, you could type this in the chat. So if we, if we have 960 ticks per quarter note, and the very first tick starts on 000, zero, zero what is the last tick number before it flips over again? Right, we've got 960 ticks. Yes, Chris, that's exactly right. 959, because zero is the first tick. So 959 is, right, Matthew, very good. The last tick is 959, and then it starts again at zero. So if the first tick was one, the last tick would be 960. The first tick is 000, zero, zero so the last tick of each beat of quarter notes is 959, okay? So the way it breaks down just for quarter, for, for square, you know, eighth notes and quarter notes, eighth notes and 16th notes is that this is the first eighth note of every beat has three zeros. The second eighth note is 480, which is half of 960. Then it repeats, bar one, beat two, three zeros. Bar one, beat two, the second eighth note is 480. And so on and so on. So if I say the second eighth note of any beat, quarter note, of any beat that's based on quarter notes, the second eighth note would be 480. If we were talking about triplets, that's a little different. We'll get into that if it was like six, eight time or something like that. Now we'll move over to 16th notes. So 16th notes, like every other note value, the very first 16th note starts off with three zeros. The second 16th note is 240. The third 16th note is 480. And the fourth 16th note is 720. Right, so you notice that all of the divisions, the subdivisions, all end in a zero. Right, they don't end in a one. If this first tick was zero 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 one, this would be two hundred forty one. This would be four eighty one. This would be seven twenty one. But it starts with zero zero zero, so these are all on zeros, and that's actually much easier to remember. Right, so you could see that the pattern just repeats over and over again. So then. If there are, uh, if there are, let's say there, so there's 960 ticks in a quarter note. So if you had an eighth note triplet, so this would be for graduate students and undergraduate if you're a music major. So if you had an eighth note triplet, the first eighth note triplet would start on zero, zero, zero. What would the second eighth note triplet start on? Right, you got 960 total. So what's 900? So if the, how many triplets are there in a quarter note? Eighth note triplets in a quarter note. Anybody? Uh, 320. Matthew, very good, excellent. Right. So an eighth note triplet would be 960 divided by three, or 320. So the first eighth note triplet would be zero. The next one would be 320. Then you would add 320 to that. So the th third eighth note triplet would be 640. Right, so let me show you that inside of Pro Tools. So this this is part of the download materials. This stuff is a little confusing, but seriously, through repetition, you get this stuff really quickly. 
Also, just be so, so that I can say this right now, there are multiple ways to view things in Pro Tools and every DAW, and there's multiple ways to um, do the same task. And it typically just depends. So if I typed in 480 here, and you could see right here, this is where the uh, playback head is, that is halfway so at 480, you can see I'm halfway between 1 and 2, right? If I type in 720 here, you could see that I'm 3 quarters of the way between 1, beat 1, and beat 2. Now, let's change the resolution here to triplets, right? So I've got that set for 16th note triplets, but let's do 320, right? That's the first triplet, that's the second triplet because the first triplet starts at the downbeat. You can see that we're one third of the way through, right? If I type in 640 here, whoops, 640. You could see that we're two thirds of the way between beat one and beat two. So these are numbers that you should know. 240, 480, 720, 320, and 640. Those are the most those are the most common rhythmic divisions, right? Um, you know, 320, 160 would be for a, a, a 16th note triplet. But if you can just, you know, at some point know those, it would be very helpful to your understanding of how this timing thing works in ticks. And that'll be important when we start quantizing and doing all that editing stuff as the semester goes on. So any questions on that? I'm looking over at you now on the screen over here. All your lovely selves. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, this has always been a difficult. Um, actually, uh, sorry to interrupt. Could I, uh, just, just in regards to the, the ticks, is it, you know, just for the rhythmic value, just kind of just do. So in this case, um, how you arrived at 320, it was just 960 divided by three. Correct. At, okay. And then similarly for 960 divided by four, which Would I be guess. 240. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. And then 960 divided by 6 would be 160 for if for, yeah. for 16th note triplets, right? And then, you know, you could get really like, see, that there becomes a problem though, right? Because um, let's do the math. <laughs> Hold on, because th th there becomes a problem. Let's get, uh, let's get out the uh, calculator. See, and this is a, this is why having a really high resolution. So we've got 960. Well, what if we wanted to do quintuplets, five notes divided by five? Okay, equals. So we'd get 192 ticks for each one of those quintuplets, right? So I mean, that's that. Those work out fine. But what if we had 960, and we wanted to do sept, sev, seven seven. Uh, seven eighth notes in the time of 16 of, of eight right yeah you see you don't quite get on it doesn't it's not exact now you're probably not going to hear that right but it, it doesn't it doesn't divide in exactly so there is a rhythmic discrepancy in playback with midi um on some some advanced and more detailed you know ry rhythmic subdivisions there are ways around that where you could do something stupid like double the tempo and play half as fast and it would make a better resolution. But I don't know if you'd actually hear that small of a, of a discrepancy, right? It's going by so quickly, but you'll see that it's, yes, Chris. Yeah, sorry. It might just be that I'm like not amazing at math, but if our max is 359, if we wanted to do like a third of that for a triplet, why is it not? 960. 960. Our max is 960. Oh, sorry. Sorry. If we, but isn't the highest tick 959? Yes, but but it starts zero. on zero. So if we do a triplet, why isn't it uh, three nineteen instead of three twenty? 
Oh, okay. Well, let's take a look. If we're starting at zero, I, I mean, like, no, no, I'm no, I got you. I got you. I got you. So let's see. The grid is, let's, do, let, let me just, uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can help you out with that. So let me just figure out a way to explain that a little bit better for you. So if I do this, recent items are calculator. So we're going to start on zero, right? And 960 divided by three is 320, right? So if I add, 320 to zero, I get 320. Awesome, thank you. Right, if I, if I start on, let's say this started on one and I added 320, to, oops, sorry, excuse me. See how that becomes 321. So, oh, thank you. right, yeah, it's, no, it's confusing. Trust me, it's confusing. Um, I, I, those questions are good because you're probably not the only one who had it. You know, so hopefully that clears that up for everyone. Um, yeah, okay. So that's a half an hour on ticks and quantizing and, and well, we didn't do quantizing, but the resolution. And everybody understands that when you play a note in MIDI, it's going to land on one of those 960 spots. And, you know, where, if you're playing, like I said, let's just say you're playing nine in the time well if you're let's say playing 11 uh in the time of eight so you got something that's going one two one two right and you fit between each one of those notes those beats 11 notes they're not going to fit on on exactly on where they should be they're going to be moved so that they are in the closest tick right so remember when i did that little the last little math problem here, uh, recent items, calculator, right? So let's say um, five divided, let's say, let's do that, let's do that, 11. So you got 960 divided by 11, right? And that comes out to this, 87.272727, right? So it's probably gonna put your first one on uh, 86, 87, or whatever it is, right? And then the next one is going to be on 87 plus, you know, it's going to, it's just going to add, it's going to round it down and add it to the most, the, the whole number, right? So that if you had 87, right, that would be where the first one of those uh, quintuplets would be, or the, yeah, the quintuplets would be, or what did I do? I divided that by five, right? Let's see. I divided it by 11. Yeah, so one of the, the first uh, one of those eleven tuplets <laughs> um, would fit on tick eighty-seven, but in all actuality, this is where it should be, right here. But you don't have that resolution, so it, you're not going to hear that, generally speaking. But it does make a difference, you know. Um, which is why I wish the Pro Tools had the opportunity to have a bigger resolution. Okay, so there you go. Always start on zero. All right, so that's a little confusing. I got it. But I think that just from doing, you'll get better at it. All right? Just from doing, you'll get better at it. Um, you'll see the numbers and you'll know what they mean just from doing it. There's many ways to edit. Remember I said there's many ways to accomplish the same task inside of any inside of Pro Tools, but really inside of any sequencer. And you need, what I do is whatever is happening at that moment, the more techniques I know how to fix something or change something, the better off I'll be because the situation dictates which technique you use. So... Let's say I wanted to adjust the rhythmic timing of something. Well, if everything is, if I played something in really badly, I should probably play it again, right? But if I played something pretty well, but it just needs to be tightened up a little bit, I can select all those notes and do a function called quantizing to them that would fix everything, but they'd all be fixed to a formula. 
But what happens if I play everything really well, but there's only a couple of notes that's off? Well, I might want to, I could quantize just those couple of notes, but maybe I just want to manually edit those couple of notes, right? So what I want to do, what I do for all my students, all my classes, is we first learn how to manually manipulate notes to, and we do things so that they're perfectly set up to the grid. By the end of the semester, I'm not going to want you to be doing that. I want you to make music. And always gridding music is only good for techno and disco and, and that. Gridding music has ruined <laughs> uh, a lot of music. But, I, but you do need to know that as your reference point so that you will be able to move forward. And so we're going to learn right now um, how to manually edit notes for duration, start time, start point, and duration, and how to manually edit the velocity of each note so that you can change the volume and the timbre of each note. So we're going to start, and we're going to start off doing that with the uh, with the Bartoki stuffy. Let's start off with the one uh, for the undergraduates that was very simple, right? So. I played this in really badly. Right, so you can hear that. And the, again, let me just show you a couple things here. So this is clicking while it's playing. I, I hate that. So what you want to do is double click on the metronome and change your click count off option so that it's only during record. And then hit OK. All right. So I'm going to edit this stuff and make it all work to the grid. And we'll show you s several different ways. Now, you you do that, you can do that right here on the edit page, but what I prefer teaching the students is to do it in one of the two MIDI editors. Now, let me show you, there's, if you go up to window here and you click, you have something called MIDI editor, and that brings up this big screen, right? And I might show you in this screen, but then you've got multiple screens going on. So what I typically do is, since I've got three monitors when I'm working in my studio, I usually have this on one of the monitors off to the side, you know, so that it's not in the way. So I'm, I might show you how to edit on this because I can make it really big. But what I want you guys to do is to use the MIDI editor that's located on the Arrange page or the Edit window. So that is found right here. There's a little line with an upward facing arrow. And when you click on that, you get open this little sub window at the bottom of the page. And this up here is the toolbar for the edit window. The MIDI editor has its own toolbar, which is located over here. And I'm going to zoom in on that in a minute, but just let me get this set up so that it's fitting in my screen a little better for zooming in. So this is the toolbar here for the MIDI editor. Now, let me just show you a little something here. If I zoom way in, you'll see that this MIDI editor has a gold or yellow outline here, right? That means that you this window, this area of this big window is active. The second I click here, let me get rid of this too. You'll notice that it has changed and that there is now a gold bar around the edit page uh, toolbar. So, and this only occurs when you've got this MIDI editor open over here. Okay, so now I'm in here and this is gold here, right? If I click up here, see how that disappears and that's gold up here. And if I close this like this, notice that the gold bar has now disappeared from here. So that only works when the MIDI editor is open. And it lets you know which window is active. Now, yours might open up looking like this, right? And you can resize this. So if you, if I scroll here, I'll zoom in so you can see this. If I scroll here, hover, you'll see that the my cursor turns to a cross and I can click and drag up on that. And then that resizes that window so you can make it nice and big so you can see it. 
very easily. So that's the first thing to notice. And if we look left to right, and let me go over here, this area here is the tracks list, right? And this is the MIDI tracks list. You'll notice up here that there's also a tracks list for your edit, for your edit page, and then there's also a groups list. We'll learn groups later in the semester. Now, in the tracks list, you'll notice that there is a little pencil next to mini, this mini grand here and that it's highlighted. That means that that is the track that is in this width editor here. If I were to do this, you'll notice that it disappears. There's nothing, right? It doesn't even have to be um, highlighted, but this little dot has to be turned on, right? And it's active in here. And you can have both instruments, many instruments, inside of this window. And if you want to see them, if they're both the same color here, and you click here, you can see that they can be separated. So that's this little guy here. And then you can go back to the original colors, right? So if you wanted to edit both at the same time, you could do that. I often, if I've got like a lot of stuff going on, I'll have multiple tracks open in here, and I can just be editing them all without having to go you know, click on this and click on that. I can keep track of this stuff. It's just from experience. It's not that I'm so great. It's just because I've been doing this for so long. And if you guys do this for a little while, you'll be able to do that no problem. Now, remember how last week, let me close this again. I asked you guys as part of the setup, or maybe two weeks ago, to turn on the A and the Z over here so that it's active. That's the keyboard focus, keyboard edit focus. Now, when you open up your MIDI editor, you'll see that there is one of those over here, right? Let me get this in the middle so it's easier for you to see and I can zoom way in, right? You can see that right here. So when this is active, because it's got the gold yellowish outline, this will then become active. If I go up into here, you see that it's now active in the edit window and not here, but if I come back down here, it becomes active. So that automatically changes depending upon which part of the edit window you're working in. So this is the tracks list. This helps with the colors, and let's click on this. And then this is a keyboard. So this is called a piano roll editor because it looks like a piano roll, right? What you'd see on an old-fashioned player piano roll. And if you look here, it's set up like a piano with C and then two black keys, F and then the three black keys, just like a regular piano, but you'll see these numbers, two, three. These are MIDI note numbers, right? So I scroll down and I'll show you how to do that in a second. Right here where it says two, this is called C2, right? So every note between here and here has the suffix two. So this D here would be called D2. This E flat or D sharp would be called E flat 2 or D sharp 2. This G would be called G2. When we get up to C here, this would be C3. This would be D3, F3, A3, right? And, or A flat 3. And then 4. This would be F4. And conversely, scrolling down, right, that would be C1 and then C0, and then minus one. Now there aren't minus and plus in, um, there aren't minus one on a piano, but there are some instruments that have programmed notes down here, which I don't think we will have in our class, but that's why there's, you know, it goes down two octaves below the lowest note on a piano. Okay, now notice how let me just switch to the screen view here so that you can see everything. Now, you can't see the MIDI notes anymore because I've scrolled. So if I'm here, right, I can use, I've got my mouse, and you can do this with a touch bar too. You can scroll up, I mean with a touchpad. You can scroll with two fingers up and down or you can use your mouse to scroll up and down like this. As long as, and it can be any of the tools, as long as you're in the field here not clicking, just scrolling. And additionally, you can scroll left and right. And you can do the same thing with, yeah. 
right, with the touchpad. So if you're working on a laptop, you can do all the same stuff. So that's cool. Um, now, each one of these blue things, these are all MIDI notes, right? This is piano roll notation. Um, the R and the T key work. You can zoom in and out. You can also change the size of the notes by clicking on this box here. And then there's a box down here where you can also click to make things bigger and smaller. Plus and minus. Oh, you can't see that because my face is, my hands are in the way. Let's move this over here and zoom in again. All right, so there's a plus to make it bigger and minus here. And then also down, whoops, excuse me. Down here, you see this left and right? Well, there's a little bar down here that you can click and scroll left and right also if you'd like. So there's many ways of moving around in there. Now, let me show you a really great key command here. If you want to fit the entire track inside of this window, it's Control, Option, and the letter A. And see that? It fits all in. Control, Option, and the letter A. Let's say you want to get you, you've got this much selected and you want to see just that in the window. It's control, so control option A for all, control option F for fit, right? So that fits that amount inside of the window. So that's two really cool key shortcuts for you Pro Tools ninjas. And any, any uh, sequencer has commands like that. You just have to find out what the key control, what the, what the keyboard commands are. But for Pro Tools, control option A for everything, or all and control option F to fit the selected um, number of notes. All right, so I want to fix this rhythmically, okay? I've got it close, but you can see that it's not exactly accurate. So the way I'm going to fix that is I'm going to use some of my tools up here and I'm going to go into grid mode, and that's clicking here. Now, keyboard shortcut to change the edit modes, right? You hold down the command key. I've got my function keys set up. So F1 is shuffle, F2 is slip, F3 is spot, and F4 is grid. Um, now, let me zoom out again. Now, to move from your different tools, right? F uh, control or command two is the trimmer, command three is the the selector, command four is the grabber, and command six is the pencil tool. So those are the ones that we're gonna be working on, right? Two, three, four, and six. And that's an easy way to navigate rather than moving your mouse up, rather than doing this. It's just easier to navigate that way. Okay, so let me zoom in. So I'm set up for grid, and we only have quarter notes and, um, is the smallest rhythmic value here so I can make my grid be a quarter note and then I'm going to use my select my trimmer tool so that's command uh, two and then I'm going to hover at the end of this note I'm just going to click and it's going to snap right to that grid right so you see this one's a little bit early if I just click it'll snap to that grid it ends a little bit late so I'm just going to snap and just snapping everything to grid right I'm not doing anything but just getting close to the end and snap it, clipping on that, and it just snaps it to grid. Now, you can also, if I wanted to make this note short, I could click and drag there, and that'll snap to the grid that way. But I'm making these notes all the, um, right, so this is what I'm gonna want you to do for next week on all of your pieces. is to just make these things rhythmically perfect. Or this is, this is, yeah, this will be due for next week, right? So you're just gonna go through and you're gonna snap through and you're gonna make everything rhythmically exactly perfect. And again, let me just iterate that this is an exercise to learn how to do this work, right? It's like learning scales on the piano or your instrument. You don't play scales, but you do have to know them to, to work. Great, so that's now rhythmically perfect. 
and then I can select this and do the same thing to this. All right, and you can see that I can zip through this really quickly. It's not a big deal. Now, there is an automated process to this, and I will show you this uh, in, uh, in the next class or on the next assignment, uh, on the next sequencing assignment, which will be in three weeks, I believe. But for right now, we're just doing this manually. And it's a little cumbersome and a little bit like busy work. But, you know, I can get through this stuff pretty quickly. And it's just a matter of learning rhythmically perfect. Right? And if I hit the return key. Now. Notice how the playback head went past the page and it stayed here. What you have to do is go right here, this little circle, click on that, and then there's something called scrolling. Well, let me get that so you can see it. All right, so you're right here, you click on this, it says scrolling, and then you just, what I like to do is page. Then it, it turns like, like a book, right? I don't like continuous, it makes me seasick. After playback, I don't like that either. So here we go. It'll, and there you go, it changes the page. Okay, so that's how you would edit the rhythmic value of that particular piece. It's pretty easy. You know, it should take you, when you're first doing it, like half an hour, 40 minutes to get through that uh, for your undergraduates. We're going to work on the other bar talk in a second. Now, let's get to, um, back to just one instrument here. There we go. Okay. Looking better now. Um, now, there's, the MIDI is... A spec that has a resolution of 127 or 128, right? Because some MIDI starts, it's, it's, it depends on whether they start at zero and go to 127 or one and go to 127, right? You can, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit, that's one thing that's a little incongru incongruous. But the MIDI spec is. A, a res, another term, another way of using resolution. So it has 127 steps. Now, this has been the same since 1984 when they first introduced MIDI. And there is a new MIDI spec that the manufacturers are working on that's going to have much more resolution to it. But um, the, so, in other words, if you are doing vo volume of an instrument, right? there are 127 steps or 128 steps. Let's just say there's 127 steps. So there are, if you say something has a velocity of 50, the velocity is the speed with which a note on a keyboard is pressed down. Not how hard you hit it, but how fast the note actually goes down. Typically when you hit it harder, it'll go faster. But after a certain point, you can't get any higher than 127, and you can't get any softer than zero, right? So th that's the MIDI spec. So the way that that's shown on Pro Tools is in the editor, you open up another area that's called a lane, L-A-N-E, -E, like on a highway. You have four lanes on a highway, three lanes on a highway. So let's talk about that and make that a little bit clearer to everybody. Now down here at the bottom let's see let me get this so that i can zoom in a little bit more right you see the sideways facing triangle if i click on that you see it opens up a lane and this lane is called the velocity lane this is the lane and then what you can do right here is a little box if you with a triangle so if you click on that there's more things that you can see there's 127 different lanes that you can see but these are some of the mo most used ones so they're you know right here and then right here these are some of your most used controllers so make sure that when you open this that it says velocity you may open it and there may be 
other lanes in here. You don't need to see that. You can just click and the minus sign. You notice to the left of that box is a plus and minus. You can add lanes and you can remove lanes by clicking that. I find that to have more than one lane open at a time is very confusing. I just go back and forth between the different lanes when I'm doing different work. And I will show you how to, how to automate some of those other lanes. Um, but every note is an event and it has an individual event velocity for each event, right? Now, in the lane, if we go all the way over to the right-hand side, you see that it's got a bar where you can go up and down. And it's also got a plus and minus where you can resize the lane like that. Now, additionally, like I said, there's more than one way to do things inside of Pro Tools. Over on the left, there are two other ways to resize the lane. You can hover, it, it turns to a cross, you can pull down. Or right here on this gray bar right here, if you click, you've got all these size. So I can make it micro, or I can make it extreme, or I can, you know, just make it medium, make it small, and then you could see everything, and then you can just adjust it to fit. So you'll notice for every note, and every one of these notes is an event, it has, it's an individual, one of these things, right? And each, these things here are called stalks, S-T-A-L-K-S, and that's like a stalk of celery, right? And they tell you what the velocity level of each note is. The higher up, the larger the velocity, the further down towards the bottom, the smaller the velocity. Now, if I click on this, right, you could see that there's a number there. That's a velocity of 103. If I were to click on this one, it's a velocity of 90. Now, notice that the box stays over here for the velocity number. It doesn't go over the stalk that you're touching. 97. So each one of these is a little different, right? So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna now the next thing I want to do is I'm going to solo this so I can just hear the right hand part. And the way there's two ways of doing that. You can solo this up here, right? Or you can solo it right here. So I'm going to click solo the shown track. So this is the only track that's showing. I'm going to click here. And then this is, I won't hear the left hand. Okay, so now let's think about this for a second. How do we want to phrase this, right? Because we can, we can, we can change, we can choose phrasing with velocity by changing the volume of a note and also by the duration, right? So I'm going to show you how you can change the phrasing of this in a second using duration, but let's just talk about velocity. Da, 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 da. So if I want to do something like that, I could simply use my grabber tool and make these, right, similar, and then maybe bring the velocity down for this and up a little bit more for this, and then this comes up, and then... So this is a possibility, right? So now let's listen to that open. Right, so you can see that, you know, I don't know if that's what I want. I don't know if that's the best, but I'm just showing you what the possibilities are, right? And the way that I did that was I simply clicked on each note and dragged up and down with the mouse. And you can see over here what the, what the velocity is. So if I wanted to really exaggerate this, maybe I want the beginning to not be so loud. I can just drag this. Now, if I, if all, if I wanted to make all of these softer at once, I can also, if I have the grabber tool or the selector tool, I can click and just highlight all these and these all become lit and then when you click any of them, and notice with the number over here, let me zoom in, 
The number doesn't tell you the velocity value. It tells you how much you've taken off, that's a negative, or how much you've added, right? So that's pretty cool. And then if I this is all too loud, I can s select, let's say I use my selector tool. I can just click like this, right? And then I can go back to my uh, grabber tool and I can just drag all these down. Right, so now you're seeing that like what I played in, I played in badly on purpose, but now I'm phrasing it. So even though it's rhythmically perfect, it actually sounds more musical because I'm doing some dynamic work with it, right? So, you know, you can you go through the piece and this is the work you do. Now, let me show you a few other ways that you can work with velocity manually, all right? Notice I've got the grabber tool selected here, right? And when I hover over a note, whoops, excuse me. When I'm just hanging out in this field here, in the piano roll field, notice that wherever I am, the keyboard all the way on the left here becomes blue. It tells you what note you're hovering over. Right? Now, notice that it's a cross. When I watch what happens to the shape of the cursor when I get to the note it turns to the grabber so I can do use that to click and drag a note up and down right so that's a way way of moving a note but also if I hover and I hold down the command key right this is another great shortcut you see that the the grabber turns to a sideways trimmer and then if I click you'll see on it you'll see up here you'll see the velocity 74 if I click and drag up you'll see that I'm making that one note louder right so after a while you'll get good enough at doing this that you won't have to really look at that velocity lane for everything you do you can just hear and do it with the with the uh, with the grabber and the command key to turn it into a sideways trimmer so that's pretty cool uh, that's pretty cool now I also use this guy to change the pitch by clicking and dragging, right? Well, there's another way to change pitch and that is to use your arrows, right? So if I hit the up arrow, the note goes up in half steps. If I hold the shift key down and hit the up arrow, it goes up an octave. If I wanted to undo that, it would be Command Z. And if I wanted to go down an octave, hold the Shift key and hit the down arrow and it transposes it down an octave. So, chromatic, up and down. Shift key, up an octave, down an octave with the up and down arrows. So that's pretty cool. Let me show you a couple of other things you can do to change the velocity of notes. Now, right here we've got our pencil. And for the first couple of assignments, I want you to practice using, and you notice that it's got a little triangle. There are different shapes. I did show this. So if I right click on that, you've got all these different shapes, right? And for MIDI, freehand line, triangle, square, and random work. Parabolic and S-curve do not work with MIDI, so don't bother with them. But what we're going to use is the line tool until you get your mouse skills better. I don't need to, I use the mouse, this, the line tool sometimes, uh, but I can use the, the freehand and get the results I want because I've been using the mouse to do this for years. And you, you will too if you do it, you know, just really literally a couple of weeks, you should be able to do it with it. With it. But if you want to use the, the um, line tool to start off with, that's great. Now, to change the, the, the velocity, you would click and drag. Oh, wait, nothing happened. I clicked and dragged in here and nothing happened, right? The reason nothing happened 
is because I've got a note selected right here. Now, I can't do anything with these notes in this area right here with the pencil until this is unselected. So I'm just going to click up here and then that becomes unselected. And then I can click and drag like this and see how they all change. So if I wanted to make a crescendo here from this note up, I can go just click right across like that. And if I wanted to do a really dramatic day crescendo, I can do that and like that. So you can really quickly Now, that's exaggerated. That's not what you'd really want musically. But I'm just showing you the technique, right? So you can really quickly go through and, and edit this out manually. And there are automated ways to fix the rhythm. There are automated ways to fix note duration. There are automated ways to fix velocity and all sorts of stuff. But I want you to learn these techniques first. That's why we're doing this. Okay. Now, another thing I want to show you about this... Um, a couple of other things I want to show you about the edit window. So let's, this is our first note, right? So we can see that that's in uh, a, an A. Uh, this is like killing me. Uh, there we go. Okay, great. So it's finally working, right? There's some, this, this is definitely buggy right here. Okay, so let's say I've got this A and I wanted to add a C, right? There's two ways of doing that. There's three ways of doing that. You could do something called MIDI merge and play it back in while you're recording and I'll show you that later in the semester. Or I, th I think I might have showed you that with the Bartok. But what you can also do here is you can hold down the option key and the option click drag and then boom, you've got your two, your two notes. Another thing you can do, and I'm not sure if this is going to erase the note or not, is that you want to see how long this note is. So this note is a half note. So you want to select your grid as a half note. And then I can use the pencil tool and just draw, draw that in there like that and click. So that's another way of entering notes. But notice the, um, the velocity is different, right? It always defaults to 80 when you're using the pencil. So you, you might want to bring that down. So if you wanted to add a note, there's a couple of ways of doing that there. Okay, so that's, so So for example, if I was at the end and I wanted to, let's say I wanted to, I wanted to draw some chords in here, right? I could use the line tool and let's see, I, if I want to draw a D minor chord, right? And I'm moving the pencil up and I'm looking over here as I'm moving the pencil to see what my pitch is. And then I'll add a C so that I've got my D7, D, whoops, D minor seventh chord. And let me show you another technique. So if I wanted to change the, the duration of all these, right, I can just click so that they're all selected and then I can go to my trimmer tool and click and they'll all drag out. Just like that. Now, let's let me let me do a series of chords here, all right? And I'm going to show you this key command in in the future. <laughs> but for right now, let me just do this. I'm just going to play a series of chromatic chords, right? So this is just minor sevenths going up in half steps. Now, if you're a good pianist, you can change the, vo the volume of any of those notes by your playing. And typically the most important thing are the outer voices, right? So if you're playing two-handed piano, right, it's what you're playing with your pinky of your left hand. And typically if you're playing melodies in your right hand, it's typically the, the fourth and fifth fingers, right? So what you learn how to do is to put more weight on the, that area of your hand or play it in a way where the, the ex, extremes of your hands hit the chords and really quickly the rest of your hand fills in so that you don't perceive that they're not all being played at the same time. So th those are a couple of techniques that you, that you use. 
to voice things properly here when you have chords, and this is very important to bring out the melodic concept, the melodic contours, is you want to shape this so you can simply, right? Let's do this so you can see this. So if I want to, I can, if I, let's say I click on this. Oops, hold on. Click on this, hold the shift key down, just click, I can just click on all these and they all become selected, right? I can make the, notice the stalks are illuminated here, but if I bring this up, you're going to see two, you're going to see two diamond heads, right? This is for the top note, and this is for the other three notes. So I can make that top note louder, and then I can just simply click and drag and hold the shift key down, and a click and drag, and those are selected, and then I can bring the bass note up a little bit. So now I've got three velocity layers, and I should be able to hear the chromat both the external voices louder than the internal voices. Okay, so that works, but let's make that more exaggerated. So I'm going to select all of these, right? And I'm going to bring everything down. And then I can do the same thing here. I can click, uh, hold the shift key down, just click on the tops of the stalks and see how it's selecting just those notes. And I can bring those up. And then I can do the same thing with the bass notes because we know they're the second highest up. And I can bring those up. And this should be more exaggerated. And if you want to phrase that more, you can simply click like this and you can make this softer, right? A little bit louder. And then decrescendo, a little down. So let's take a look at that. Oops, let's make that up half step. Okay, so you can see how with some careful manipulation, you can shape what you've played in and make it much more musical, right? You have to understand though, what, what you're trying to do, right? I'm trying to voice my chords here. I'm trying to make a melodic contour, and I'm going to do that with dynamics. Um, and so, once you get the concept, these are the these are tools that you can use to achieve that. Now, the one other thing I want to point out here is that you notice that all of these are a different color, gray or blue or whatever it is, battleship gray. And you notice that that corresponds: the darker the color, the higher the velocity. You see that? That's all the way up at the top. You see how dark that is now? And the reason it's like that, and I like to see that because that helps me visually. I don't need to know the numbers. I can just see that right now that the melody is louder than the inner voices and the bass is the second loudest. The reason we have that is we went to our preferences at the beginning of the class and we set it up so on the display tab so that the MIDI note color shows velocity, right? So the color of the note shows the velocity by how intense the color is. And that's a useful tool. So now you know what that is. Okay, so let me stop for one second before I continue on. Any questions on any of this? So this, those of you that um, did this as undergraduate students, you're going to you're going to fix the, the note lengths and you're going to create melodic phrases with velocities for next week. Um, okay. And then there's going to be an assignment, a, a third level to this assignment that will be once we get, I, I, I'll, I'll assign it at our next in-person class. Um, okay. No questions. Now, some of you, how many of you had, have had sequencing experience before? Like in Logic, you maybe you went to Berkeley and you took Logic. Yeah, I have. Uh, I've used a Digital Performer. Yeah, so Digital Performer is a very old um, sequencer, it, and and it's it's excellent. And it's it's most people that use it nowadays are film composers because it has a lot of um, functionality that's very helpful for creating film scores. When I first started sequencing, I was debating between performer, uh, computer sequencing, and vision. And I, ch I chose vision because, 
I don't know, because Jan Hammer and a bunch of other people I knew were using it. And then after I'd been using Vision for eight years, they sold the their they sold the company to Opcode was the name of the company. They sold themselves to Gibson, the guitar company. And Gibson used them as a tax write off and the company went down the you know, down the t- tubes. So um if I had done Performer, I'd still be using Performer now. So anyway, I switched over to Pro Tools because I had, I had been using Pro Tools. And I think I told the story before. I didn't have time to learn a new sequencer. Okay, so GarageBand and Soundtrap. I don't know Soundtrap. Hmm. I've used Soundtrap also. It's a good um, educational one. I've used it uh, teaching... Um, middle school general music actually oh, it's very to... accessible it's, it's kind of like a garage band it's it's very um it's very powerful um but yeah it's that that's right it's a subscription based uh, it's a browser one um but uh yeah it's good good for good for educational stuff for sure they have a big library of like um loops and midi loops and audio loops and stuff and you can easily put stuff together if you're maybe not much of a musician you know wow i never heard of it before thank you for educating me on that Soundtrap. I'll have to look that up. All right. Um, okay, so this is good. Let's take a look at the one that we did for the graduate students. And then there'll be a couple of other things that I want to show you. You're going to have to give me a minute because I hear my dog crying in the other room because... Um, uh, just let me get her in here because my wife is probably out right now and this doesn't happen at our house but down here it's been an issue so give me one second I'm going to mute myself <laughs> I'll be back in like 10 seconds all right so this this one um, let me quickly edit this one all right so this is really sloppy so I'm going to do the same thing I did before but I want to do a couple of other things and I also want to change uh, change the tempo on this. I'm going to make this much faster. Let's say make it 120. Okay, so now I'm using the big MIDI editor. All right, so it's easier for everybody to see. So I've got my grid set to eighth notes because there are eighth notes in this piece. And I'm just going to quickly go through this. Hey, bud, stop with the crying. Oh, man, it's so embarrassing. And I can quickly go through this stuff, right? Okay, so it's just the first few bars I think I messed up. So that's pretty much fixed. Now, uh, what I want to do here is I want to start off, notice how, look at how the velocity is all loony. So I'm going to use my pencil tool, and I'm going to do a line. I'm just going to make everything nice and even just to start with, right? So I'm just going to click and drag everything across. Now, I'm going to solo this one out, and I'm going to hit, whoops, I'm going to hit the return key. Okay, so right there. Now, uh, as there are a couple of people, at least Maxfield I know is a violin player. So he knows that this D is on an open string on a violin, which is how that's done. So I'm going to make that a little softer, right? So I'm just going to click and drag down on those two. And I'm going to do that for all of these doubled notes because these are all being played on the open strings of the violin. So I'm just going to go through here like this, just, and select these things. All right, so we've gone through that. So, right, so now you Whoop, let me fix that rhythm there. Now you can hear that it's all, you know, it sounds very stiff and we're going to work on the phrasing in a second. But what I want to show you here is, is let's change the, um, res- there's only eighth notes being played, right? So I want to change the grid to, well, I'm going to leave it at 16th notes. That's what I had it set at. But you can start doing phrasing by changing the na- the length of the notes, 
right? And I'm just gonna do something here and then you can hear. Right, so now that you've made it perfect, like the next thing to do is to, and again, this is if you can't play this stuff in, you can start phrasing all this stuff. And you can, you know, you could die yet. Like in the second time through, I can make it different. Or beep by ya. And it on this on the piano sound, it's a little percussive, but if you change that to a flute, then you'll start getting staccato and longer notes, and it, the phrasing will start to really come come out, right? So, and then once you start adding some velocity to this, right? Oh, come on, my poor dog. <laughs> right, you can see it's getting more musical, right? So you need to massage these things and work this stuff out. But this is the way that you sort of go through your piece and you can... And you can just phrase the whole thing out like that, right? And so that's what I would like for you all graduate students to do with this is to get everything. You can either do the phrasing as you go along or you can make everything, you know, right to the grid and then go back and do the phrasing afterwards. So, um, and you do that with both hands. And then, you know, like, for example, with the left hand, you're, you're like, let's... Uh, Let me just fix this really quick. Oh, here we go. So I'm just clicking, right, and dragging these all in. So with this here, you know, if I go to my pencil tool, and let's say I want to do a, oh, let's see, something must be selected. So I want, might want to do like a little crescendo up to this point here and then back down. I'm just making stuff up to just to see what it sounds like. So let's now listen to the two of these together. So you see how when there was this little space right here, where the blue track wasn't playing, I made the, the, the red track a little bit louder so that it, you know, so that it's, it had its little solo moment. Right, so you, those are kinds of things that you, you calculate and figure out and plan and put into your piece as you're working on it. So, now for graduate students, get this finished up. Let, let me show you what the end goal is gonna be for you guys going forward and we'll talk about this. So let me close this out and I'm gonna play you one by um, Andy Warren. I think he might have graduated last semester as a graduate student. So now, what is this, right? Well, you notice that right here, he's got the first two, the piano tracks, they're all done. And you can see that they're sort of grayed out. That's because he made, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see that. Whoa, excuse me. So you could see that the, these top two tracks are the piano tracks. They're grayed out because he's made them inactive. And I'll show you how to do that in our next class. And you'll notice that he's got a lot of tracks here, right? He's got 17 additional tracks or 16 additional tracks. And you'll notice that they're all, they seem to be color coded in certain ways, right? So let's, Let's break this down. And he did this as a chamber orchestra. You could do this with any. And for those of you that are doing the easier bar talk, the undergraduate students, use any sounds you want, right? As long as they are appropriate for the pitch register, for the, you know, for what pitch you're playing in. So in other words, 
you know, if you've got something very high, you're not playing a double bass because that doesn't sound right. Um, so just, you know, if you're using synthesizer sounds or any kinds of sounds, you'll, you'll, you'll pick them up. But I'm going to talk about that more when I, after our next, when I assign this next uh, version of this. So let's take a look at how he's got this set up, with the, which is track organization. So... Uh, let me get this in the middle so we can see these names a little better. I'm, zoom I'm just looking at the screen and seeing how I can zoom in. Okay, so you should be able to read this. So you'll notice here that it's flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, horn, trumpet, trombone, and tuba. So what is that? Where is that typically found? Why does he have it set up like that? Anybody venture a guess? It's uh, where they would be sitting in an orchestra, just on an orchestral score. Yes. Yeah. 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 Adrian. Yes. If you can justify it. Yes. Um, yes. So he set up the score and this is how I work also, except I put the trumpet above the horn because I like to see things by pitch. But yes, he's done this as if it was an orchestral score. And you should think about how you're going to arrange things when you're putting your session together and breaking this out into a larger piece you know, after this, like in two weeks, you're going to start doing that. So in other words, you don't have the low strings by the flute. You don't have, you know, you keep things where they're next to each other because you're working with little groups of instruments. And I'm actually going to speed this up because I, I hate the pedantically slow tempo of this piece. So let's take a listen to what he's done and we'll break it down. Now, you notice a couple things he did was that there were certain areas where certain lines were a little bit more prominent, like in this area here. Right, the lower pitched instruments here were, were definitely louder, and he decided that he wanted to bring that loud that line out as opposed to the melodic top line out. And then the other thing he did, which was right here, and I'll show you how to do this next week, is that he did a Ralentano. Right, he slowed everything down. So he orchestrated this for four winds, four brass, some, some percussion, and some strings. But he, and this is what I'm going to suggest you do also with the strings, is that you don't break them out into um, violin one, violin two. We don't have that. They don't sound good inside of Expand, right? So um, what I will tell you for graduate students, if you've got your own computer, right, your own computer, and you go to Spitfire Audio, and undergraduates too, if you've got your own computer and you go to Spitfire Audio, you can download for free. And um, Oh, come on, bud. Stop with the crying. You can download something called BBC Discover for free. You just have to send them your information and then wait like a, a week and then they'll let you download it for free. All right. And then you can install this and then you can have not great, but much better sounding orchestral instruments than what comes with Pro Tools. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I'm just letting you know that uh, I tell, at film for the film scoring students, I tell them all to download this and get this installed in their computers to use. So um, if you want to write orchestral music, this is a good, inexpensive, well, free. You know, it's, it's good freeware. It, it comes with its own player. You don't have to worry about anything with it. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a great tool. And it, it'll sound better than these. And uh, it wasn't available, I don't think, when Andy did this. So 
and, and I have it in my computer so you can certainly use it if you want. So that's just an option for you guys. Now, he broke this thing out and you know, basically I'm gonna teach you to copy and paste and delete stuff and make a quick arrangement out of this. So this is basically what he's done with this. So at the beginning, you know, he's got his winds and Sorry, the purple. And notice where he's changed, right? So the first, he's playing the, the low line, the piano two or the violin two. He starts off in the bassoon. And then he switches to the clarinet, right? And the reason he does that And those of you that are doing the other piece, you have to think about this too, right? Is that there's phrasing here. So let's see. Let's see if I can get this. One second. Right, so he saw the music here. The first phrase is di tu ta, di ta, di tu ta, and then the next phrase here he changes the instrumentation, and that's called orchestration. Right, he didn't have the bassoon play this entire bit because that would be boring. He played the first phrase with the uh, with the bassoon, and then switched to the clarinet. Right, so this is, you know. That's the musical intent there. There's a new phrase there, so you can cert and that goes to here, right? And what's cool about this piece is that these phrases after the downbeat, they start after they, you know, after the first measure, they all start after the downbeat of each measure, right? It's kind of cool. So that adds to the interest of the piece, I think. So, and then, um, let's see. So what else? So then in the strings. Whoops. And then the string stop playing. So the, for the beginning, right, you've got the bassoon. And then he switches everything, the whole color changes. Right, so these are kinds of things that when you're writing and orchestrating and arranging that you really should think about what's the structure of the piece and how you're gonna break it down and how you're gonna um, change the sounds, right? And this is, you know, I do this all the time on a much more complicated level, but you know, you start off here and you, you, you can sequence this. If you guys were writing out, graduate students were writing something out in Finale or Sibelius or something, you would orchestrate for like this as well. It's the same thing inside the sequencer. It's just all, all the, just because you're using uh, sampled instruments and all that, the, the principles of orchestration apply no matter what instrument groups you're using. If you're using all electronic instruments, if you're using a combination of acoustic and electronic, if you're using sampled instruments, you know, the, the, same, the principles of how to orchestrate a piece and how to tell a story as a piece is unfolding, they're the same no matter what type of music you're doing, right? And, and that's just, this is a way to do this inside of Pro Tools. So that's that. Okay, so that's just a little example of that. And I'll show you more of these in our next class. Like for example, there's uh, the next assignment will be another piece by Bartok for graduate students. And I can show you, um, give me one second here. Right, so this is uh, this is a different Bartok piece, and we'll get. Into, this is by a student named Anna Whitaker. She graduated a few years ago, but she took a piano piece, and this is how she um, orchestrated it.
So, you know, she changed harmonies. She changed, um, you know, she changed a lot in that. And I, I encourage that. And then the next one is uh, Tom Lee, who works in the office now. He uh, also took these classes. And let's see, he did the same piece, TL, right? Here we go, 3, 6, 17. So this was four, five years ago, Tom took these classes. Jeez, I can't believe it, time flies. Oh, so he set this up so that it sc scrolls during playback. So let me show you why I can't stand this. So I'm getting seasick looking at that scrolling over. So if you want to change this, you have to go over to um, Options, Edit Roll Scrolling, Page instead of Continuous. Uh, so Tom, in this, he did he sort of did his orchestration from the uh, Schumann School of Orchestration, where everything is doubled, everything is doubled, and everything is doubled again. So, um, but it's still, you know, he did all sorts of tempo stuff and this is literally just a few weeks after learning how to sequence and he was a undergraduate student at the time. So this was pretty good work for that. So, um, okay. So we're going to work on this. This will be the next piece that we work for graduate students and undergraduates. There'll be a, a easier piece for you to work on. Is there any questions on anything we've done so far today? Uh, I have a general question about uh saving um this was on this uh, the assignment that we just did is it okay if i ask that yep now or i can no, wait to no, the end no. if you want. um so uh i realized that i recorded the uh bartok at a slower tempo because i'm a terrible keyboard player um and then i uh, i submitted it realized that i had never uh changed the tempo back to 80. so i went back and did that but the thing is when i saved after making that change um my the everything in the folder chain like a bunch of the folders were missing after that like the audio files folder and stuff oh, 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 oh. I so, went, um, I went, okay not a problem let me show you something oh yeah oh okay great yeah. i thought i went over this but maybe maybe yeah i just saw that happen on yours that that's exactly what happened on mine. right so I'm, maybe I'm, did I'm, I, I did watch the video again and maybe not, I okay missed no, it, not a no. problem it's not a problem these you're not the only one who probably needs to hear this so i'm going to just create a new session and i'll call this test all right test um just for just for fun and i'm going to save this on my desktop all right so this is my test session folder, and you'll see that Pro Tools has created all of these other folders in advance of any data being in, entered into them. Okay, you'll notice in the audio files folder, there's nothing there. In the bounced files folder, there's nothing there. In the clip groups folder, there's nothing there. And in the video files folder, there's nothing there. And then everybody knows that this is your session file and that this over here, this is your session folder that contains your session file. Now, I'm gonna just do something really quick here. Stereo, oh, I have one other thing I wanted to show you too. Okay, yes, this reminded me of it. So let's do mini grand, create, and then I'm just gonna play something in free time with no worry about anything. Okay, so I played this in, right? And I'm going to save this. And then I'm going to, um, let's see, let me move this so you can see both the, f the session, the, the window and the folders. And um, I'm going to close the session and watch what happens in here. Boom, they all disappear. I'll open that session up again and they all reappear. Now, 
I'm going to do something here, which I'll teach you later in the semester. And I'm just going to bounce this to disk. All right. And boom. And then you notice that now there's something in the bounced files folder, right? So if I close this out, save. Notice the bounce files folder stayed here because there is data in there. There's a, a file. All right. So these folders only stay when data is entered into them. They disappear when you close the session out unless when there's no data in them. And it only keeps the ones that it has available um, that has data. Give me one second here. All right. So this is another student's version. Right. So she did a very full, big arrangement, right? But she made a mistake. And let me show you what the mistake is. These are her instrument tracks, and they have in the audio output just one pan, right? It is, in other words, right here, in the first ones that she did, she's got a left and a right. And then on this one, the pan is only in the center. Can anybody venture a guess as to what she did and what's wrong here? And how to rec and what 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 I want to, you to avoid doing is it maybe a mono track? Correct. So she made a mono instrument track. All right. So always be careful that your instrument tracks are stereo. We work in stereo, and they, they just sound better. And we're going to work on panning and all that stuff. You know, for w w when we finish up this assignment. But that's one thing I want to um, just warn you about in advance, right? She, she made all of her instrument tracks as mono tracks. So then she had to go back and add all these instruments back in again, color code them again, and then copy and paste all of this data onto the other. Uh, right? It was, it, you know, it's like it's a pain in the neck. It took her like another hour to f fix up, right? So you can avoid that by always making sure that command shift N First thing you do is make a stereo, make it stereo instrument track. So just that's just something to be a, a little thing to be aware of because it's ha it actually happens more often than you would imagine. All right. Okay, so I think at this point, um, that's all I've got prepared for today. Again, no class in person next week. You'll watch those two videos um, and you'll just do that assignment. You'll, you'll, you'll do your editing for velocity and note length for the bar talks, undergraduate and graduate. You'll upload that into the proper folder for next week. I will look at it before the next time we meet in person. Uh, well, I'll, I'll look at it and get you feedback after I get back to New York. But for next week's class, you're going to watch those two videos and you're going to write um, the, the essay. And that essay is due on the 3rd of March, I believe is the date. It's... Yeah, on the 3rd. So for the 24th, you'll get your edits of velocity and load lengths uploaded. There'll be no in-person class. Then you'll watch at some point those two videos. You'll write your, you know, your PDF and, and you'll upload it as a PDF. And uh, actually, you know what? You you can upload it as as a document as well because I, I, I learned on the Google Drive, uh, the OneDrive, uh, it'll it'll translate it immediately from there, so I don't have to download it and upload it to. Google. I don't have to do that. I can do everything right on that. So, if you, I typically just like PDFs, but if you forget and you upload it as a document, don't don't worry about it. It, it works fine for this. And then I will see you all on the third of March. All right. Thank you. Thank, uh, Professor. Yes. It, um, I realized my mistake with saving the file. I just fixed and uploaded another file to the OneDrive. Under um for my thing, right? But you uploaded a session folder, right? That's been zipped. Yes, I did. Okay, great. I, I, they're both up there now. I can't get rid of them, but they're both there now, so okay. everything should be there. Right. I'll just take the one that has the later date on it, timestamp on it. Thank you. It should be the one from like ten minutes ago. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a great weekend, and I will talk to you soon. Take care. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Everybody.
A lot of stuff we went over today. A lot. <laughs> Professor, if I could just have a moment. Yes. Who's this? Oh, J um, Jacob. Yes. Yeah, just a few things. I just want to introduce myself since this is the first uh, class I was able to attend um, with the late switch. So thank you for allowing me to enroll. Um, secondly, I was looking at the house rules and it actually said,